Hello everyone, welcome to Phosphor G2021. This is the Humahuaca Zoom in the morning, and next we will be having Michael Montanay, who will be presenting the next two talks. Hello everyone. He will be he will be starting with uh, with open hist uh, history map architecture of time space mapping. So, uh, when you are Michael, do you want to share something? Uh, yes, I want to share my screen. Thank you very much. Share screen. Uh, okay. Here it is. Okay. Let's begin. So, hello everyone, and welcome to my presentation, Open History Map. Um, Open History Map is an, uh, is an organization, is an association uh, that aims at the creation of a tool chain and a tool set uh, that tries to use uh, historical data and create history maps with modern WebGIS tools. That's basically the, the, the simple description. But the, it's great to see you again, because we met already in Boston in 2017. Uh, and again, in Darabet, it was uh, something less uh, core to our project. The most interesting aspect of what we presented in Boston was the fact that we had an idea of what OM was based on our experience of the uh, GIS world and the geographic information based on public participatory archaeology, WebGIS, open access data, best effort, and uh, um, for the user and by the users. What happened then is that we based our, our work on a, a set of assumptions that go uh, that that defined the, the our work and our project as a set of um, elements and of uh, um, items that were based on uh, the, the fact that most information that we gather in in OpenStreetMap and the geographic information processes are physical elements that need to be located in space and time. The, the real complexity here, uh, we didn't know that yet, but the, the element that was core in this discussion was the fact that each interpretation is bound to a specific research and each research needs to be traceable. This was a, a, a very simple, one simple slide that we put there in, a, in the presentation in 2017. And then things happened, life went on, and we thought that we had, the, the, our idea of uh, Open History Map was this complex blob that contained everything that contained all the um, the main information that we wanted to uh, to manage. What uh, little did we know that things in the meantime had changed and most importantly that um, during the the next years uh, there would be a um, in late 2019, uh, I had the ability the possibility to look at the, the data again and we understood that, something had changed and in 2020 when the lockdown began uh, we started working on a few other data sets and we uh, were able to finally sit down and work on something else so where are we now and we will go back to the, arch uh, the architecture of the whole system in a few uh, in a few minutes where are we now we are now we have a working map a working vector map that contains data about this is for example the frankish uh, um, uh, empire uh, the, these is the situation of the world during the just before uh, the common era, where all the with all the the, the major um, countries and major cultural areas are defined are already well uh, almost well defined and almost established. And these are the cities, the the, the places known to Strabo, according to um, the Pleiades project, and the, the the Gazetteer by Pleiades. Mm. And this is a, a, a deeper zoom on our area, on the area of northern Italy, where uh, I'm talking to you now from. You can see there are sm small uh, errors in the in the transformation because we don't rely on. Um, digitized data, yeah, that would purely digitized data and uh, independent data, but rely on data sets that are already uh, av online available, public domain, and or uh, with fair use uh, um, 
licenses or um, possibly open access data. And the, the fact is that we didn't know that the, the blob we were looking at the beginning was in fact an ecosystem in itself uh, where all the parts are uh, cover one specific uh, sub area of our, uh, of our infrastructure. And this means that, for example, we have uh, around our open history map, we have the open history map index, the, the, the data index, the, the map itself, uh, open history map viewer, the event index, the data collector, and the whole public history toolkit. And these are all tools, all instruments, all parts of a greater uh, ecosystem that I want to share with you. We have uh, worked on a lot as uh, a complete uh, architectural overhaul over the, the the project that we had defined in 2017. Uh, the um, this is the, the the current architecture, current ish architecture of uh, Open History Map. We have a an area that is the Open History Map map itself, the historic historical street view. Uh, the event index, the data collector, and the um, data index. Uh, around that, there are a set of uh, extra uh, um, elements that enable us to understand and better uh, uh, and, and work with our uh, infrastructure in a smart way. And just not to to be um, heavy on on the, the the central infrastructure of the system. Let us start from the from the first and the core, basically, of the data, which is not the map in itself, but it's something slightly different. It's the data index. We based uh, our project, uh, the, the, the definition of the index, on the um, Open Knowledge Foundation Open Data Index. Uh, and uh, we basically define this as the Open History Map Data Index, representing um, all the uh, dimensions and the di data sets we want to collect and we want to work on to import them into the main map. For example, and this is the result uh, of this uh, of the of the data index. Uh, we have an overview of several topics, and you can navigate there to uh, on the on the browser. You can uh, see the several topics that are covered, and several subtopics that are covered for each of them. Uh, we can define an area uh, of, um, of interest for a specific research, and we can define a period of research from a beginning to an end. And the, the, all the, the whole database is stored in Zotero as a um, public um, collection of researches. And as such, we're able to um, rely on the fact that all the data is completely public at any point, all the, the libraries and the, the, the interfaces and the API is completely open and uh, available to anyone to, to do something similar and to work on that uh, source. And as such, we're able to, uh, we, were, we had to define a set of um, a small ontology to describe our data sources. For example, we have the geo names and the ID of the of the geo name to represent a specific a specific element. This, for example, is uh, part of the data set of the uh, map of the Frankish Empire uh, uh, during the the Frankish Kingdom during the the, the period from 40, 450 uh, CE to 900 CE. We have several um, elements in this uh, in this. Um, in this description, we have, for example, the area, the data set format, the data set type, and these two are usable for the automated import. Um, the, the from time and the to time, so that we can define how the, the, the whole period that we're covering. The data quality, source quality and source reliability. This was a main topic during our first uh, uh, presentation in 2017, and it still is a very important one. And then we have, the, the main topic, politics, because it's a political uh, um, outline of the, of the region or regions. And we have the structure. 
because we're just giving the outline and not no, and no specific detail we can there is a whole uh, um, information section about the the the, the several uh, the various um, elements of this um, ontology on the index website and if uh, people want to share with us new uh, content they can by sending us an email with the details and we can work on new elements to add to the to the infrastructure once we have the zotero id we can start importing the data into the uh, infrastructure this is the the import element and on github we have we're working to, uh, currently on this uh, on this aspect and we're collecting importers for the specific uh, data sources so we can slowly and but but replicably uh, recreate the whole database in a long but simple process this is the map itself and it's quite complicated and it is composed of several parts uh, one of them in the front end the open history map map uh, which is based on angular and uh, mapbox glgs we're converting in map libre uh, in very soon and it is open everything is open source only of this we have the the link but all the parts of this project are um, completely open we have a tile server with flask and sql alchemy again this flask will probably be uh, left for um for uh, fast api but we're still uh, deciding uh, what to do the open history map service which is simply the um, writing part for the importer or for the uh, other tools that we're working on um that does the exactly the writing on the database which is in flask rest full service but we will uh, want to uh, convert it to um, web feature service uh, 3.0 tomorrow we'll i'll be talking about the caching system the only part the the, the the caching system which is quite complicated because of the problem of representing time we will see that in a few in a few seconds how it impacts only the part that is not cached and this is already complicated enough because our main element of support is PostGIS. And with PostGIS, we have a beautiful database, which is very simple, based on almost only two tables, the items and geom the geometries. Um, the, the, the most interesting aspect is exactly this. We have only two tables, and this simplifies a lot uh, our, our approach to the world, meaning that we only have an item with an ID at a time frame in which it is valid is it is uh, real um and uh, a layer uh, to which this item refers to which whether it is uh, political aspects or uh, social or or um uh, city planning or transportation or so whatsoever the properties which is a json b element within the database uh, the author and a hash, a hash of its own geometry, of its own starting geometry, meaning that when once we we import the 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 element on the database, we have his hash. On the other hand, we have the table of with the geometries, and we have uh, and we, that means that we um, are hashing the storing this hash on one side and using this hash as a key. For its all of its um, simplifications, this is why I put the simplify preserve topology on the other hand, uh, on the uh, as a link here. Um, with simplify preserve topology, we're uh, able to create and recreate all the layers, all the possible levels of detail for all the objects in our database. This is obviously very um, long as an insert uh, procedure, but it is very uh, useful in order to be able to create a, an interactive map. Uh, based on this layer, and um, we're able to, uh, the, to partition the whole database automatically based on the density of the information. And this is where time becomes a, a real important factor. This is, for example, the items date table represented by um by the density meaning that before 4000 B B bce uh we know something but digitize is not much that means that i could have one partition covering all the data from 
the uh, before 4000 BCE. Then we have one partition covering just from 4000 to 3000, and then one from, and so it goes way denser and denser and denser up to the the the, um, the last two centuries, from 800, 1800s to 2000. Uh, the density of the data set it, it grows more and more and becomes more important, obviously, during, for example, World War II, where we have a lot of data about attacks, about um, actions, about um, many things that have, have been documented and are available for us to manage and to elaborate on. For the, for the geometries, there is the same system of partitioning, meaning that points are just points and they're not partitioned in any way. But for uh, po um, polygons and line strings, we have a vertical um, partitioning based on the zoom level. So for levels of zoom from one from zero to two, we are we have one partition and so on and so forth for twenty to twenty five. Why did we go so specific? Because one of the main object in the first um, in the first uh, draft of the of the um, open uh, open history map project, we wanted to um, to have the, the our idea was to be able to keep the um, the data as uh, uh, as precise as possible in any moment. To do that, we needed to. Um, to do that, we needed to to be able to zoom a lot and to see data that, uh, at very deep level of zoom, at very precise levels of zoom. Uh, this creates obviously side effects of enormous sizes for some partitions, but partitioning would be uh, is uh, gave us the ability to guarantee a way more efficient uh, space management on our uh, on our servers. The second part is the HSV, which is the historical street view, which is basically mapillary with, uh, of the past, not just covering photos uh, or, um, or images, uh, which is not, not just covering photos, but also paintings and, uh, and uh, kinas. For example, this is an overview of what we're using now with historical street view. Uh, and this is, for example, the Bologna massacre done in August the second in uh, of 1980. Uh, this is the collection of photos by the um, association of the victims of the of the Bologna massacre, and uh, we have the position of each of the photos uh, mapped and the direction of the photo uh, mapped. And as you can see, there is also already the data for the event index. Um, as I said, the event index, we already have the data, but we don't have the, the visualizations yet. We don't have the interface because it's quite complicated and we wanted to do something that was usable by the end user and, use and usable by the researcher because our target is now not just education, but, ju but even uh, more so if the, even more, um, a little bit more towards, um, digital humanities as, uh, as a whole. On the other hand, we have the uh, data collector, which is another el interesting element we've been working on. We're working with this uh, on this with uh, a group of researchers for of the University of Bologna that is working on uh, um, historical economics. So uh, we would like to work with them on on this kind of data. For the, for the um, the, the event index, uh, one of the most interesting aspects is that we have uh, been able to track positions of uh, notable elements, such as, for example, the Endeavour, ships during the uh, 17th and 18th century, which is very nice and very interesting because it enables us to really see how the, the Endeavour moved in the world and uh, how the, 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 that uh, movement improved and managed to become something uh, that changed our history. Uh, for the time series, we are using uh, several sources and several collections. And again, it, it all goes into the map, uh, into the index. And one third element that we're working on is the, uh, is the open data, um, is the public history toolkit, which should enable us to digitize these kinds of maps, which are fascinating, but 15th century maps are also, as we all know, not that easy to manage. We already have a few sets of experiments done with automated transformation,
based on the New York Public Library um, uh, tool, tools that they created a few years ago and presented a few years ago. And we're using them uh, with a few changes to on the on the um, Italian cadastre of the 1835 um, Gregorian cadastre. This is, for example, the city of Bologna. And um, exactly, this is the idea of our public history toolkit. For more info, www.openhistorymap.org. And uh, we have the map there. Please be, uh, be, 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 be gentle with the data and with the map because it's my, at the moment, it's, we, we don't have funding yet. So we're looking for funding. So it's not high level uh, infrastructure uh, at the moment. So be kind. Um, for more info, again, with openhistorymap.org or send me a ma mail for anything, for any question. And thank you. Thank you so much for the for your talk, Michael. We have a few questions. Sure. <clears throat> okay, the first one is how I contest the border is reflected in the model. Uh, sorry, I didn't I didn't get you. How I contest the border is reflected in the model. I will copy it as. Uh, thank you. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, right. Um, basically, we have the um, as a as a as a as in, within the project we have the concept of let's call it timeline, so that you can define that a specific interpretation and a specific uh, research um, covers a well, uh, let's say a well-defined. Uh, a set of data. If uh, the research is in conflict with another one, uh, our approach, and I think I personally like this uh, a lot, and because it gives you context, we think uh, we always think that if there is a conflict, then both elements sh have to be shown. Both elements, or all the elements of the conflicts, because there might be even more than two. Um, all the sides of the conflict have to be shown in the same uh, overview. And then it is up to the user to go and see all the uh, possible um, versions and understand which research more uh, is more likely to cover that specific element. We don't, uh, we avoid to be, to, to judge the, the element because considering it's ancient and past data and ancient data. Um, sometimes it can be used for political aspects, and that's sad. But on the other hand, we think that it's way more important to be able to have an overview of what uh, the idea is on that specific topic. All right, thank you. <clears throat> the next question is, is it possible or are you planning to allow including raster map layers for historical maps? Um, the idea in the beginning was to just have um, vector maps. But in fact, it is uh, very interesting to be able to uh, rely also on raster maps. Um, at the moment, uh, the we want to be able to um, I mean, the, the, the main topic is to go towards uh, vectors because in vectors we can do calculations, we can do elaborations, we can do work. Um, but on the, on the longer run and um, most importantly, if, uh, if needed, for example, for educational purposes, I can see, I've always seen the, the interest in using uh, the, the, the uh, raster, map, raster map as well as a, as, as a background. And well, in that case, I think we will uh, move towards the fact that given an area, we can show the layers of rasters that are available for that area for that period, just like, uh, and there are so many sources for that already available uh, from the, yeah, from Wikimedia to the, to the um, map bender toolkit and there are so many sources for that. And this is, for example, one of the reasons why we're working on the uh, public, uh, public history toolkit, because we want to help users or have uh, monitor uh, um, editons, editons uh, um, mapathons 
where people can work on their local history by looking at several maps of the past and several uh, sources of the from the past from kinds of books and so on to merge them thank you very much mm, i think we have time for one last question Go ahead. Uh, Had you considered having different historic scenarios? I am particularly thinking of timelines like ancient Egypt, Greece, Crete, where there are high chronologies and low chronologies, each supported by a set of academics. Yeah, um, this uh, the, 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 this aspect is something that we're um, uh, we're working on because, uh, as I said, we have the concept of different timeline. Let's say, let's say it in a in a mm, commercially uh, uh, fa fascinating way. The Marvel Cinematic Universe is something that I'm 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 a great fan of the uh, of the movies. But obviously, the Kitauri were not here in 2016, uh, entering in New York. But it could be possible to define an alternate timeline where this happened, and we can map the whole thing on the map because we have the the possibility to do that. Um, on the other aspect, meaning the um, definition of, uh, of um, uh, specific periods uh, and or local times, um, we're working to integrate the um, the data set from uh, the, the the enormous research project that is Periodo. The, and they have an, an ontology already defined of ma major um, historical periods and historical moments within the, several kinds of contexts. Uh, but this also creates a huge uh, complexity. And this is the reason why the interface for the event index is not yet available, because it's quite complicated to mix these two, uh, these two aspects. Because on one side, we have the event index per se, that is that uh, basically is works on something similar to um, an event based an event. Uh, um, it works. It's let's say it's uh, steps away from the works of uh, event based linked data, which represent just the um, pure events happening in over time, and takes a, takes some of the approaches of uh, prosopopy, meaning the lives of people and representing also their elements. And we try to do that with a, a GIS approach, meaning if the event is worldwide, let's say, then A, why is it worldwide? How is it worldwide? Is it just the event that is worldwide or is it, or the event is local, but the, the, let's say it ripples all over the world, meaning that it has impact all over the world. So there are many elements that uh, we have to consider to define the concept of, um, uh, period in in uh, per se it's uh, it's something that we're defining and it's more of a problem of user interface and user experience honestly because as a concept it's not easy to grasp but easy to define and easy to uh, structure so yeah this is the, the we're trying to work in that direction we're trying to integrate the elements and if you follow us, we will soon uh, get the, the 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 event index out, and uh, there will be we, we will be exposing all the data and all the information about the this kind of transformation. Okay, thank you so much for the information. And um, we will be thank having you. now a little pause until half past, where uh, you will be presenting the next talk. Is that right? Yes. Well then. <laughs> See you in a Let's, few minutes. Yeah. Uh, we will be starting a half pass, most likely. So see you then. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> 